Hi, and welcome to Living Room Shakespeare. Uh, we are so glad to have you back for tonight's performance. Tonight we'll be, we will be performing George Bernard Shaw's Arms in the Man. Uh, our cast is waiting in the wings and they are very excited to start tonight's performance. Uh, as always, we would like to remind you that many of our actors consider the Center for Performing Arts in Rhinebeck to be our theatrical home in better times. And the center is currently in the midst of a matching drive to earn a $25,000 grant. So any money you can donate now, either on this post or at their website, centerforperformingarts.org, will be matched if they reach the 25 grand uh, threshold. And so that is a great opportunity to donate twice. Uh, so, oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, so we're so excited to have this show tonight uh, and we are excited to have you here with us. And uh, we are excited to be bringing this show tonight and then we'll be bringing uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona next week, followed by an original by one of our actors who is also a playwright. So please stick with us tonight and then come back next Saturday, the Saturday after we're gonna be continuing on for the foreseeable future. And we are excited to have you all here with us tonight. Without further ado, uh, tonight's show is Arms and the Man. And here we go with act one. It is night in the ladies' bedchamber in Bulgaria in a small town near the Dragoman Pass, late in November in the year 1885. Through an open window with a little balcony, a peak of the Balkans, wonderfully white and beautiful in the starlit snow, seems quite close at hand, though it is really miles away. The interior of the room is not like anything to be seen in the east of Europe. It is half rich Bulgarian, half cheap Viennese. Above the head of the bed, which stands against a little wall cutting off the corner of the room diagonally, is a painted wooden shrine, blue and gold with an ivory image of Christ, and a light hanging before it in a pierced metal ball suspended by three chains. The principal seat, placed toward the other side of the room and opposite the windows, is a Turkish ottoman. The center pane and hangings of the bed, the window curtains, the little carp carpet, and all the ornamental textile fabrics of the room are oriental and gorgeous. The paper on the walls is occidental and paltry. The washstand against the wall on the side nearest the ottoman window consists of an enameled iron basin with a pail beneath it, a painted metal frame, and a single towel on the rail on the side. A chair near, near, near it is of Austrian bent wood with a cane seat. The dressing table between the bed and the window is a common pine table covered with a cloth of many colors with an expensive toilet mirror on it. The door is on the side nearest the bed, and there is a chest of drawers between. This chest of drawers is also covered by a variegated native cloth, and on it there is a pile of paperback novels, a box of chocolate creams, and a miniature easel with a large photograph of an extremely handsome officer whose lofty bearing and magnetic glance can be felt even from the portrait. The room is lighted by a candle on the chest of drawers and another dressing table with a box of matches beside it. The window is hinged doorwise and stands wide open. Outside, a pair of wooden shutters opening outwards also stand open. On the balcony, a young lady, intensely conscious of the romantic beauty of the night and of the fact that her own youth and beauty are part of it, is gazing at the snowy Balkans. She is covered by a long mantle of furs, worth on a moderate estimate about three times the furniture of her room. Her reverie is interrupted by her mother. Aina! Aina! Heavens, child, are you out in the night air instead of in your bed? You'll catch your death. Luca told me you were asleep. I sent her away. I wanted to be alone. The stars are so beautiful. What is the matter? Such news. There has been a battle. Ah! A great battle at Slimitsa. A victory, and it was won by Sergius. Oh, mother, is father safe? No, of course. He sent me the news. Sergius is the hero of the hour, the idol of the regiment. Tell me, tell me, how was it? Oh, mother, mother, mother! You can't guess how splendid it is. A cavalry charge. Oh, think of that. He defied our Russian commanders, acted without orders, led a charge on his own responsibility, headed it himself, was the first man to sweep through their guns. Don't you see it, Raina? Our gallant, splendid Bulgarians, with their swords and eyes flashing, thundering down like an avalanche and 
scattering the wretched Serbians and their damnified Austrian officers like chaff. And you, you kept Sergius waiting a year before you would be betrothed to him. You have a drop of Bulgarian blood in your veins. You will worship him when he comes back. What will he care for my poor little worship after the acclamations of a whole army of heroes? But no matter, I'm so happy, so proud. It proves that our ideas were real after all. Our ideals real? What do you mean? Our ideas of what Sergius would do, our patriotism, our heroic ideas. I sometimes used to doubt whether they were anything but dreams, what faithless little creatures girls are. When I buckled on Sergius's sword, he looked so noble. It was treason to think of disillusion or humiliation or failure. And yet, and yet, promise me you'll never tell him. Don't ask me for promises until I know what I'm promising. Well, it came into my head just as he was holding me in his arms and looking in my eyes that perhaps we only had our heroic ideas because we were so fond of reading Byron and Pushkin and because we were so delighted with the opera that season at Bucharest. Real life is seldom like that. And he'd never, as far as I knew it then. Only think, Mother, I doubted him. I wondered whether all his heroic qualities and his soldiership might not prove mere imagination when he went into a real battle. I had an uneasy fear that he might cut a poor figure there beside all those clever Russian officers. Poor figure? Shame on you. The Serbians have Austrian officers who are just as clever as the Russians. But we have beaten them at every battle for all that. Yes, I was only a prosaic little coward. Oh, to think that it was all true, that Sergius is just as splendid and noble as he looks, that the world really is a glorious world for women who can see its glory and men who can act its romance. What happiness, what unspeakable fulfillment. Ah. If you please, madam, all the windows are to be closed and the shutters made fast. They say that there may be shooting in the streets. Uh, the, the Serbians are being chased right back through the pass, and they say they may run into town. Our cavalry will be after them, and our people will be ready for them, you may be sure. Now they're running away. I wish our people were not so cruel. What glory is there in killing wretched fugitives? I must see that everything is made safe downstairs. Leave the shutters so that I can just close them if I hear any noise. Oh, no, dear. You must keep them fastened. You would be sure to drop off to sleep and leave them open. Make them fast, Luca. Yes, Don't madam. Be anxious about, Don't be anxious about me. The moment I hear a shot, I shall blow out the candles and roll myself in bed with my ears well covered. Quite the wisest thing you can do, my love. Good night. Good night. Wish me joy, the happiest night of my life, if only there are no fugitives. Go back to bed, dear. And don't think of them. If you would like the shutters open, just give them a push like this. One of them ought to be bolted at the bottom, but the bolt is gone. Thanks, Luca. But we must do what we are told. Good night. Good night. Reina, left alone, goes to the chest of drawers and adores the portrait, there with feelings that are beyond all expression. She does not kiss it or press it against her breast or shoo at any mark of bodily affection, but she takes it in her hands and elevates it like a priestess. Oh, I shall never be unworthy of you any more, my soul's hero. Never, never, never. She replaces it reverently, then selects a novel from the little pile of books. She turns over the leaves dreamily, finds her page, turns the book inside out at it, and with a happy sigh, gets into bed and prepares to read herself to sleep. My hero, my hero. A distant shot breaks out in the quiet of the night outside. She starts listening and two more shots, much nearer, startling her as she scrambles out of bed and hastily blows out the candle on her chest of drawers. Then, putting her fingers in her ears, she runs to the dressing table, blows out the light there and hurries back to bed in the dark, nothing being visible but the glimmer of the light in the pierced ball before the image and the starlight seen through the slits of the tops of the shutter. The firing breaks out again and there's a startling fusillade quite close at hand. While it is still echoing, the shutters disappear, pulled open from without, and for an instant, the rectangle of the starlight flashes out with the figure of a man silhouetted black upon it. The shutters close immediately, and the room is dark again, but the silence is now broken by the sound of panting. Then there is a scratch, and the flame of a match is seen in the middle of the room. 
Who's there? Who's there? Who is that? Shh. Don't call out or you'll be shot. Be good and no harm will happen to you. Take care, it's no use trying to run away. Remember, if you raise your voice, my revolver will go off. Strike a light and let me see you. Do you hear? Excuse my disturbing you, but you recognize my uniform? Servian, if I'm caught, I shall be killed. Do you understand that? Yes. Well, I don't intend to get killed if I can help it. Do you understand that? I suppose not. Some soldiers I know are afraid of death. All of them, dear lady, all of them, believe me. It is our duty to live as long as we can. Now, if you raise an alarm... You will shoot me. How do you know that I am afraid to die? Oh, but I suppose, suppose I don't shoot you. What will happen then? A lot of your cavalry, the greatest blackguards in your army, will burst into this pretty room of yours and slaughter me here like a pig, for I'll fight like a demon. They shan't get me into the street to amuse themselves with. I know what they are. Are you prepared to receive that sort of company in your present undress? Hardly presentable, eh? Stop! Stop! Where are you going? I'll need to get my cloak. A good idea. I'll keep the cloak, and you take care that nobody comes in and sees you without it. This is a better weapon than the revolver, huh? It's not the weapon of a gentleman. That's good enough for a man with only you to stand between him and death. Do you hear? If you're going to bring those scoundrels in on me, you shall receive them as you are. No use. I'm done for. Quick, wrap yourself up. They're coming. Oh, thank you. My lady. My lady, get up quick and get out and open the door. What will you do? Never mind. Keep out of the way. It will not last long. I'll help you. Hide yourself. Oh, hide yourself quick behind the curtain. There's just half a chance. If you keep your head, remember, nine soldiers out of ten are born fools. A man has been seen climbing up the water pipe to your balcony, a balcony, a Serbian. Uh, the soldiers want to search for him and they are also so wild and drunk and furious. My lady says you are to dress at once. They shall not search here. Why have they been let in? Raina, darling, are you safe? Have you seen anyone or heard anything? I heard the shooting. Surely the soldiers will not dare come in here. They have found a Russian officer, thank heaven. He knew Sergius. Sir, will you come in now? My daughter will receive you. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, gracious lady. I am sorry to intrude, but there is a fugitive hiding on the balcony. Will you and the gracious lady, your mother, uh, please withdraw whilst we search? Nonsense, sir. You can see there is no one on the balcony. Cease firing down there, you fools! Do you hear? Cease firing, damn you! Could anyone have got in without your knowledge? Do you sleep? No, I have not been to bed. Neighbors have their heads so full of runaway Serbians that they see them everywhere. Gracious lady, a thousand pardon. Good night. Don't leave my mother, Luca, whilst the soldiers are here. A narrow shave, but a miss is as good as a mile. Dear young lady, your servant to death, I wish for your sake I had joined the Bulgarian army instead of the Serbian. I'm not a native Serbian. No, you're one of the Austrians who set their Serbians on us to rob us of our national liberty and who officer their army for them. We hate them. Austrian? Not I. Don't hate me, dear young lady. I'm a Swiss, fighting merely as a professional soldier. I joined Serbia because it came first on the road from Switzerland. Be generous. You've beaten us hollow. Have I not been generous? Noble. Heroic. 
but I'm not saved yet. This particular rush will soon pass through, but the pursuit will go on all night by fits and starts. I must take my chance to get off in a quiet interval. You don't mind me waiting just a minute or two. No, I'm sorry you'll have to go into danger again. Won't you sit? Oh! Don't frighten me like that. What is it? Your revolver! He was staring that officer in the face all the time. What an escape. Oh, is that all? I'm sorry I frightened you. Pray, take it to protect yourself against me. No use, dear young lady. There's nothing in it. It's not loaded. Loaded, by all means. I've no ammunition. What use are cartridges in battle? I always carry chocolate instead, and I finished the last, the, the last cake hours ago. Chocolate? Do you stuff your pockets with sweets like a schoolboy, even in the field? I wish I had some now. Allow me. I'm sorry. I have eaten them all except these. You are an angel. <laughs> mm. Bless you, dear lady. You can always tell an old soldier by the inside of his holsters and cartridge boxes. The young ones carry pistols and cartridges. The old ones, grub. Thank you. Oh, don't do things so suddenly, gracious lady. It's, it's meant to revenge yourself because I frightened you just now. Me? Do you know, sir, that the, though I am only a woman, I think I am at heart as brave as you. I should think so. You haven't been under fire for three days as I have. I can stand two days without showing it much, but no man can stand three days. I'm as nervous as a mouse. Would you like to see me cry? No. If you would... All you have to do is scold me as if I were a little boy, and you my nurse. If I were in camp now, they'd play all sorts of tricks on me. I'm sorry, I won't scold you. You must excuse me, our soldiers are not like that. Oh, yes they are. There are only two sorts of soldiers, old ones and young ones. I've served 14 years. Half of your fellows never smelled powder, powder before. Well, how is that, and you've just beaten us? Sheer ignorance of the art of war, nothing else. I never saw anything so unprofessional. Oh, was it unprofessional to beat you? Well, come. Is it professional to throw a regiment of cavalry on a battery of machine guns with the dead certainty that if the guns go off, not a horse or a man will ever get within 50 yards of the fire? I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw it. Did you see the great cavalry charge? Oh, tell me all about it. Describe it to me. You never saw a cavalry charge, did you? How could I? Perhaps not. Of course. Well, it's a funny sight. It's like slinging a handful of peas against a window pane. First one comes, then two or three close behind him, and then all the rest in a lump. Yes, first one, the bravest of the brave. You should see the poor devil pulling at his horse. Why should he pull at his horse? It's running away with him, of course. Do you suppose the fellow wants to get there before the others and be killed? They all come. You can tell the young ones by their wildness and their slashing. The old ones come bunched up. They know that they're mere projectiles, and it's no use trying to fight. The wounds are mostly broken knees from the horses cannoning together. I don't believe the first man is a coward. I know he's a hero. That's what you have said if you've seen the first man in the charge today. I knew it. Tell me. Tell me about him. He did it like an operatic tenor. A regular handsome fellow with flashing eyes, shouting his war cry and charging like Don Quixote at the windmills. We nearly burst with laughter at him. But when the sergeant ran up white as a sheet and told us they sent the wrong cartridges and that we couldn't fire around for the next ten minutes, we laughed at the other side of our mouths. I never felt so sick in my life. But I've been in one or two very tight places and I hadn't even a revolver cartridge. Nothing but chocolate. We'd no bayonets, nothing. Of course, they just cut us to bits. And there was Don Quixote, flourishing like a drum major, thinking he'd done the cleverest thing ever known, whereas he ought to be court-martialed for it. Of all the fools ever let loose on a field of battle, that man must be the very maddest. Indeed. Would you know him again if you saw him? <laughs> Should I ever forget him? <laughs> This is a photograph of the gentleman, the patriot and hero to whom I am betrothed. I'm 
really very sorry. Was it fair to lead me on? Yes, that's Don Quixote. Not a doubt of it. <laughs> Why'd you laugh? <laughs> I, I didn't laugh, I assure you. At least I didn't mean to. But, but, but when I think of him charging the windmills and imagining he's doing the finest thing. <laughs> Give me back the portrait, sir. Of, of course. Uh, certainly. I, I'm really very sorry. Well, perhaps I'm quite wrong. You know, no, no doubt I am. Most likely he had got wind of the cartridge business somehow and knew it was a safe job. That is to say he was a pretender and a coward. You do not dare to say that before. It's no use, dear lady. I can't make you see it from the professional point of view. So much the better for you. How? Oh. You are my enemy and you're at my mercy. What would I do if I were a professional soldier? Ah, true, dear young lady. You're always right. I know how good you've been to me. It's my last hour I shall remember those chocolate creams. It was unsoldierly, but it was angelic. Thank you. And now I will do a soldierly thing. You cannot stay here after what you have just said about my future husband. But I will go out on the balcony and see whether it is safe for you to climb down to the street. Down that water pipe? Stop! Wait, I, I can't. I daren't. The very thought of it makes me giddy. I came up it fast enough with death behind me, but to face it now in cold blood? It's no use. I give up. I'm, I'm beaten. Give, give the alarm. Come, don't be disheartened. Oh, you are a very poor soldier. A chocolate cream soldier. Come cheer up. It takes less courage to climb down than to face capture. Remember that? No. Capture only means death, and death is sleep. Oh. Sleep, sleep, undisturbed sleep. Climbing down the pipe means doing something, exerting myself, thinking, death ten times over first. Are you as sleepy as that? I've not had two hours undisturbed sleep since I joined. I'm on the staff. You don't know what that means. I haven't closed my eyes for 48 hours. But what am I to do with you? Of course, I must do something. You see, sleep or no sleep, hunger or no hunger, tired or not tired, you can always do a thing when you know it must be done. Well, that pipe must be got down. You hear that, you chocolate cream, cream soldier? But if you fall? I shall sleep as if the stones were a feather bed. Goodbye. Stop, I'll kill you. Never mind. This sort of thing is all in my day's work. I'm, I'm bound to take my chance. Now do what I tell you. Put out the candles so that they shan't see the light when I open the shutters. And keep away from the window, whatever you do. If they see me, they're sure to have a shot on me. But they're sure to see you. It's bright moonlight. I'll save you. How can you be so indifferent? You want me to save you, don't you? I, I, I really don't want to be troublesome. I'm, I'm not indifferent, dear young lady, I assure you. But how is it to be done? Come away from the window, please. Now listen, you must trust to our hospitality. You do not yet know in whose house you are. I am a Petkoff. Oh, what's that? It means that I belong to the family of the Petkoffs, the richest and best known in our country. Oh, yes, uh, of course. I, I beg your pardon. The, the Petkoffs, to be sure. That, that's stupid of me. You know you never heard of them until this minute. How can you stoop to pretend? Forgive me, I'm too tired to think. And the change of subject was too much for me. Don't, don't scold me. I forgot. It might make you cry. I must tell you that my father holds the highest command of any Bulgarian in our army. He is a major. A major? Bless me. Think of that. You showed great in ignorance in thinking that it was necessary to climb up the balcony because this is the only private house that has two rows of windows. There's a flight of stairs inside to get up and down by. Stairs? How oh, grand. You live in great luxury indeed, dear young lady. Do you know what a library is? A library? A room full of books? Yes, we have one. The only one in Bulgaria. Actually, a real library. I should like to see that. I tell you these things to show you that you are not in the house of ignorant country folk who would kill you the moment they saw your Serbian uniform, but among civilized people. We go to Bucharest every year for the opera season, and I have spent a whole month in Vienna. 
I saw that, dear young lady. I saw at once that you knew the world. Have you ever seen the opera of Ernani? Is that the one with the devil in it in red velvet and soldiers chorus? No. Then I don't know it. I thought you might have remembered the great scene where Ernani, flying from his foes just as you are tonight, takes refuge in the castle of his bitterest enemy, an old Castilian noble. The noble refuses to give him up. His guest is sacred to him. Have your people got that notion? My mother and I can understand that notion, as you call it. And instead of threatening me with your pistol as you did, if you had simply thrown yourself as a fugitive on our hospitality, you would have been quite as safe as in your father's house. Quite sure. Oh, it's useless to try to, to try to make you understand. Don't be angry. You see how awkward it would be for me if there was any mistake. My father is a very hospitable man. He, he keeps six hotels, but I couldn't trust him as far as that. What about your father? He is away at Slivnica, fighting for his country. I answer for your safety. There is my hand in pledge of it. What reassurance of you? Uh, better not touch my hand, dear young lady. I, I, I must have a wash first. That is very nice of you. I see that you are a gentleman. Huh? You must not think that I am surprised. Bulgarians of really good standing, people in our position, wash their hands nearly every day. But I appreciate your delicacy. You may take my hand. Thanks, gracious young lady. I feel safe at last. And now, would you mind breaking the news to your mother? I had better not stay here secretly longer than is necessary. If you'll be so good as to stay perfectly still whilst I'm away. Certainly. You're not going to go to sleep, are you? Uh, <laughs> here? Wake up, wake up, you are falling asleep. Falling asleep? Uh, no, not the least in the world. I was only thinking. It's all right, I, I'm wide awake. Will you please stand up whilst I'm away? All the time, mind. Certainly. Certainly. You may depend on me. Sleep. Sleep, sleep, sleep. Where am I? That's what I want to know. Where am I? I must keep awake. Nothing keeps me awake except danger. Remember that. Danger, danger, danger. Where's danger? I must find it. Uh, what am I looking for? Sleep. Danger. Uh, I don't know. Oh, yes. Yes, I know. All right. Now I know. All right. I'm going to go to bed, but not to sleep. Be sure not to sleep because of danger. Not to lie down, neither, just to sit down. Ugh. He's gone, I left him in here. And he must have climbed down from the- Oh! Hell. Fast asleep, the brute. Sir. Sir. Sir! Don't, Mama. The poor darling is worn out. Let him sleep. The poor darling? Rahina! That concludes Act One. Moving on to Act Two of tonight's performance. It is the 6th of March, 1886, in the garden of Major Petkoff's house. It is a fine spring morning and the garden looks fresh and pretty. Beyond the plain tops of a couple of, of minarets can be seen, showing there was a valley there with a little town in it. A few miles further, the Balkan mountains rise and shut in the landscape. Looking towards them from within the garden, the side of the house can be seen on the left, with a garden door reaching by a fl little flight of steps. On the right, the stable yard with its gateway encroaches on the garden. There are fruit baskets along the paling in the house, covered with washing spread out to dry. A path runs by the house and rises by two steps at the corner where it turns out of sight. In the middle, a small table with two bent wood chairs at it is laid for breakfast with Turkish coffee, hot cups, rolls, etc. But the cups have been used in the room. There's a wooden garden seat against the wall of the right. Luca, smoking a cigarette, is standing between the table and the house, turning her back with angry disdain on a manservant who is lecturing her. Be warned in time, Luca. Mend your manners. I know the mistress. 
she is so grand that she never dreams any servant could dare be disrespectful to her. But if she once suspects that you're defying her, out you go. I do defy her. I will defy her. What do I care for her? If you quarrel with a family, I never can marry you. It's the same as if you quarreled with me. You take her part against me, do you? I shall always be dependent on the goodwill of the family. When I leave their service and start a shop in Sophia, their custom will be half my capital. Their bad word would ruin me. You have no spirit. I should like them, I, I should like to see them dare to say a word against me. I should have expected more sense from you, Luca. But you're young, you're young. Yes, and you'll like me better for it, don't you? But I know some family secrets they wouldn't care to be, have told, young as I am. Let them quarrel with me if they dare. Oh, uh, do you know what they would do if they heard you talk like that? What could they do? Discharge you for untruthfulness. Who would believe any stories you told after that? Who would give you another situation? Who in this house would dare be seen speaking to you ever again? How long would your father be left on his little farm? Child, you don't know the power such high people have over the likes of you and me when we tries to try to rise out of our poverty against them. Look at me, 10 years in their service. Do you think I know no secrets? I know things about the mistress that she wouldn't have the master know for a thousand levas. I know things about him that she wouldn't let him hear the last of for six months if I blabbed them to her. I know things about Raina mm, that would break off her match with Sergius. If... Oh, do you know? I never told you. Ooh, that's your little secret, is it? I thought it might be something like that. Well, you take my advice and be respectful and make the mistress feel that no matter what you know or don't know, she can depend on you to hold your tongue and serve the family faithfully. That's what they like. And that's how you make the most out of them. You have the soul of a servant, Nicola. Yes, that's the secret of success in service. Hello, hello there, Nicola. Master, uh, back from the war. My word for it, Luca, the war's over. Off with you and get some fresh coffee. You'll never put the soul of a servant in me. Ah, oh, breakfast out here, eh? Yes, sir. The mistress and Miss Raina have just gone in. Well, go in and say I've come and get me some fresh coffee. It's coming, sir. Have you told the mistress? Yes, she's coming. Well, the servants haven't, uh, haven't run away with you, have they? No, sir. Ah, that's right. Uh, have you brought some cognac? Here, sir. That's right. My dear Paul, what a surprise for us. <laughs> Have they brought you fresh coffee? Uh, yes, Luca's uh, been looking after me. The war is over. The treaty was signed three days ago at Bucharest and the decree for our army to demobilize was issued yesterday. Paul, have you let the Austrians force you to make peace? My dear, they didn't consult me. What could I do? But of course, we saw to it that the treaty was an honorable one. It declares peace and- Peace. But not friendly relations. Remember that. They wanted to put that in, but I insisted on it being struck out. What more could I do? You could have annexed the Servians and made, the, made Prince Alexander Emperor of the Balkans. That's what I would have done. I don't doubt it in the least, my dear, but I should have had to subdue the whole Austrian Empire first. And that would have kept me too long away from you. I missed you greatly. Oh. <laughs> and how have you been, my dear? Oh, my usual sore throats, that's mm. all. That comes from washing your neck every day. I've often told you. Nonsense, Paul. Hmm. Uh -huh. 
I don't believe in going too far with these uh, modern customs. Oh, this <laughs> washing can't be good for one's health. It's not natural. Well, look at my father. He never had a bath in his life, and he lived to 91. Or 98, sorry. The, the healthiest man in Bulgaria. I don't mind a good wash once a week to keep up my position, but once a day is carrying the thing to ridiculous extremes. You are a barbarian at heart still, Paul. I hope you behaved yourself before all those Russian officers. Well, I did my best. I took care to let them know that we had a library. <laughs> ah, that's Sergius. Hello, Nicola? Don't shout, Paul. It isn't nice. Oh, bosh. Nicola? Hola? Yes, sir. If that is Major Saranov, bring him around this way. Yes, sir. We must talk to him, my dear, until Raina takes him off our hands. He bores my life out about not promoting him. Over my head, if you please. He certainly ought to be promoted when he marries Raina. Besides, the country should insist on having at least one native general. Yes, so that he could throw away whole brigades instead of regiments. That's no use, my dear. He hasn't the slightest chance of prom promotion until we're quite sure that the peace will be a lasting one. Major Sergius Saranov. Da, ah, you're already Sergius. Glad to see you. <laughs> My dear Sergius. My dear mother, if I may call you so. Uh, mother-in-law, Sergius, mother-in-law. Sit down and uh, have some coffee. Oh, thank you, none for me. You look superb, splendid. Campaign has improved you. Everybody here is mad about you. We were all wild with enthusiasm about the magnificent cavalry charge. Oh, madam, it was a cradle and a grave of my military reputation. Well, how so? I won the battle the wrong way when our worthy Russian generals were losing it the right way. And that upset their plans and wounded their self-esteem. Two of their colonels got their regiments driven back on the correct principles of scientific warfare. And the two colonels are now major generals, and I am still a simple major. You shall not remain so, Sergius. The women are on your side, and they will see that justice is done to you. Oh, it is too late. I have only waited for the peace to send in my resignation. Your resignation? Oh, you must withdraw it. I never withdraw. Now, who could have supposed you were going to do such a thing? Everyone I knew me. But enough of myself and my affairs. How is Raina? Where is Raina? Raina is here. Ah, pretty, isn't it? She always appears at the right moment. Yes. She listens for it. It is an abominable habit. Sergius yes. leads Raina forward with splendid gallantry as if she were a queen. When they arrive at the table, she turns to him with a bend of the head. He bows and thus they separate, he coming to his place and she going behind her father's chair. Dear father, welcome home. <laughs> My little pet girl. <laughs> and so you're no longer a soldier, Sergius. I am no longer a soldier. Soldiering, my dear madam, is the coward's art of attacking mercilessly when you're strong and keeping out of harm's way when you're weak. That's the whole secret of successful fighting. Get your enemy at a disadvantage and never, on any account, fight him on equal terms. Ah, Major. Ah, well, they wouldn't let us make a fair stand-up fight of it. However, I suppose soldiering has to be a trade like any other trade. Precisely. And I have no ambition to shine as a tradesman. So I've taken the advice of that bagman of a captain that settled the exchange of prisoners with us at Peru and given it up. What? That Swiss fellow? Sergius, I have often thought of that exchange since. He overreached us about those horses. Of course he overreached us. His father was a hotel and livery stable keeper. And he owned his first step of his to his knowledge 
of horse stealing. Ah, he was a he was a soldier. Every inch a soldier. Yes. What was he doing in the Serbian army? A volunteer, of course, keen on picking up his profession. <laughs> uh, we shouldn't have been able to begin fighting if those foreigners hadn't shown us how to do it. We knew nothing about it, and neither did the Servians. Yeah, there, there'd have been no war without them. Are there many Swiss officers in the Servian army? No, all Austrians, just as our officers were all Russians. This was the only Swiss I came across. I'll never trust a Swiss again. He humbugged, uh, humbugged us into giving him 50 able-bodied men for 200 worn-out chargers. They weren't even edible. We were two children in the hands of that consummate soldier, Major. Simply two innocent little children. What was he like, Raina? What a silly question. He was like a commercial tra traveler in uniform, bourgeoisie to his boot. Uh, Sergius, uh, tell Catherine that queer story his friend told us about how he escaped after Slavitsnia. You remember <laughs> about him being hid by two women? Oh, yes, uh, quite a romance. He was serving in the very battery I so unprofessionally charged. Being a thorough soldier, he ran away like the rest of them with our cavalry at his heels. To escape their attentions, he had a good taste to take refuge in the chamber of some patriotic young Bulgarian lady. The young lady was enchanted by his persuasive commercial traveler's manners. She very modestly entertained him for an hour or so, and then called in her mother, lest her conduct should appear unmaidenly. The old lady was equally fascinated, and the fugitive was sent on his way in the morning, disguised in an old coat belonging to the master of the house, who was away at the war. Your life in the camp has made you coarse, Sergius. I do not think you would have repeated such a story before me. Right, Sergius. If such women exist, we should be spared the knowledge of them. Oh, Pooh, what nonsense. What does it matter? Oh, no, 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 back up, that was wrong. I beg your pardon, I behave abominably. Forgive me, Raina. And you too, madam. The glimpses I have had of the seamy side of life during the last few months have made me cynical, but uh, I should not have brought any of that in here. This is about into your presence, Raina. I, uh... Yeah, stuff and nonsense, Sergius. That's quite enough fuss about nothing. A soldier's daughter should be able to stand up without flinching to a little strong conversation. Yes? Come, it's time for us to get to business. We have to make up our minds about how those three regiments are to get back to Philop Philippopolis. There's no forage for them on the Sophia route. Come, come along. Oh, can't you spare Sergius for a few moments? Raina has hardly seen him yet. Perhaps I can help you settle about the regiment. Oh, my dear madam, impossible. You wouldn't know. Um... You stay here, my dear Sergius. There's no hurry. Oh, very well, very well. Am I forgiven? My hero, my king. My queen. How I have envied you, Sergius. You've been out in the world, on the fields of battle, able to prove yourself there worthy of any woman in the world. Whilst I've had to sit at home, inactive, dreaming, useless, doing nothing that could give me the right to call myself worthy of any man. Dearest, all my deeds have been yours. You inspire me. I've gone through the war like a knight in a tournament with his lady looking down at me. You have never been absent from my thoughts for a moment. Sergius, I think we two have found the higher love. When I think of you, I feel that I could never do a base thing or feel think an ignoble thought. My lady and my saint. My lord and my... Let me be the worshipper, dear. You little know how unworthy even the best man is of a girl's pure passion. I trust you. I love you. You will never disappoint me, Sergius. 
I can't pretend to talk with you really before. My heart is too full. I'll get my hat and then we can go out until lunchtime. Wouldn't you like that? It'll be quick. If you'll wait five minutes, it's seen five hours. Okay. Do you know what a higher love is? No, sir. Very fatiguing thing to keep up for any length of time. Okay. One feels the need of some relief after it. Perhaps you would like some coffee, sir. Oh, thank you, Wilka. Oh, sir, you know I didn't mean that. I, I'm surprised at you. I'm surprised myself, Wilka. What was searching is the hero of Solista. Say if you saw me now. Oh, Sergi is the apostle of the higher love. Say if you saw me now. What of the half dozen Sergiuses who keep popping in and out of his handsome figure? And say if they caught us here. Do you consider my figure handsome, Luca? Let me go, sir. I shall be disgraced. Oh, will you let go? No. Well, then stand back where we can't be seen. Have you no common sense? Ah, that's reasonable. I may have been seen from the windows. Miss Raina is sure to be spying about, uh, uh, spying about after you. Oh, take care, Luca. I may be worthless enough to betray the higher love, but do not you insult us. Not for the world, I'm, sir, I'm sure. May I go on with my work, please, now? You're provoking a little witch, Luca. If you were in love with me, would you spy out of the windows on me? Well, you see, sir, since you say that you are half a dozen different gentlemen at once, I should have a great deal to look after. <laughs> Witty as well as pretty. No, I, I don't want your kisses. Gentlefolk are all alike. You make you making love to me behind Miss Raina's back, and she doing the same behind yours. <gasps> Luca. Shows how little you really care. If our conversation is to continue, Luca, you will please remember that a gentleman does not discuss the conduct of the lady he's engaged to with her maid. It's so hard to know what a gentleman considers right. I thought from your trying to kiss me that you had given up on being so particular. Devil. Devil! I expect one of the six of you is very like me, sir, though I am only Miss Raina's maid. Which of the six is a real man? That's the question that torments me. One is the hero, another a buffoon, another a humbug, another perhaps a bit of a blackguard. And one at least is a coward, jealous. I call cowards. Luca, who's my rival? You shall never get that out of me for love or money. Why? Never mind why. Besides, you would tell that I told you and I should lose my place. No. On the honor of, of a man who is capable of behaving as I have been for the past five minutes, who is he? I don't know. I never saw him. I only heard his voice through the door of her room. Damnation. How dare you? Oh, I mean no harm. You've no right to take up my words like that. The mistress knows all about it. And I tell you that if that gentleman ever comes here again, Miss Raina will marry him, whether he likes it or not. I know the difference between the sort of manner you and she put on before one another and the real manner. No, you listen to me. Not so tight, you're hurting me. That doesn't matter. You have stained my honor by ma making me a party to your eavesdropping. And you have betrayed your mistress. Please. That shows that you are an abominable little clod of common clay with the soul of a servant. You know how to hurt with your tongue as well as with your hands. But I don't care. Now that I've found out that whatever clay I am made of, you're made of the same. As for her? 
She's a liar and her fine airs are a cheat. And I am worth six of her. Luca, a gentleman should never hurt a woman under any circumstance. I beg your pardon. That sort of apology may satisfy a lady. What use is it to a servant? Oh, you wish to be paid for that hurt? No, I want my hurt made well. How? Never. I'm ready. What's the matter? Have you been flirting with Luca? No, no. What? How can you think such a thing? Forgive me, dear. It was only a jest. I am so happy today. I am sorry to disturb you, children. But Paul is distracted over these, those three regiments. He doesn't know how to send them to Philopolis. And he objects to every suggestion of mine. You must go and help him, Sergius. He's in the library. But we're just going out for a walk. I shall not be long. Wait for me just five minutes. I shall go around and wait in full view of the library windows. Be sure you draw father's attention to me. If you are a moment longer than five minutes, I shall go in and fetch you regiments or no regiments. Very well. <laughs> Imagine their meeting that Swiss and hearing the whole story. The very first thing your father asked for was the old coat we sent him off in. Nice mess you have got us into. Little beast. Little beast? What little beast? To go and tell. Oh, if I had him here, I'd cram him with chocolate cream so he could never speak again. Don't talk such stuff. Tell me the truth, Raina. How long was he in your room before you came to me? Oh, I forget. Not forget. Did he really climb up after the soldiers were gone? Or was he there when that officer searched the room? No. Yes, I think he must have been there then. You think? Raina, Raina, will anything ever make you straightforward? Bertius finds out. It will be all over between you. Oh, I know Sergius is your pet. I sometimes wish you could marry him instead of me. You would just suit him. You would pet him and spoil him and mother him to a perfection. Well, upon my word. I always feel a longing to do something dreadful to him, to shock his propriety, to scandalize the five senses out of him. I don't care whether he finds out about the chocolate cream soldier or not. I half hope he may. And what should I be able to say to your father, pray? Oh, poor father, as if he could help himself. Only you were 10 years younger. There's a gentleman just called, madam, a Servian officer. Servian? How dare he? Oh, I forgot. We are at peace now. I suppose we shall have them calling every day to pay their compliments. Well, if he is an officer, why don't you tell your master? He's in the library with Major Saranov. Why do you come to me? But he asks for you, madam. And I don't think he knows who you are. He says, the lady of the house. He gave me this little ticket for you. Captain Munchley? That's a German name. Swiss, madam, I think. Swiss? What was he like? He has a big carpet bag, madam. Evans, I'm going to return the coat. Uh, send him away. Say we are not at home. Ask him to leave his address and I'll write to him. Now stop. That will never do. Wait. The master and Major Saranov are busy in the library, aren't they? Yes, madam. Bring the gentleman out here at once. And be very polite to him. 
Well, don't delay. Here. Leave that here. And go straight back to him. Yes, madam. Uh, Luca. Yes, madam. Is the library door shut? I think so, madam. If not, shut it as you pass through. Yes, madam. Uh, stop. He will have to go that way. Tell Nicola to put it, bring his bag here after him. Don't forget. His bag? Yes. Here. As soon as possible. Be quick. Oh, how can a man be such a fool? Such a moment to select. Captain Blunchley, I am very glad to see you. But you must leave this house at once. My husband has just returned with my future son-in-law, and they know nothing. If they did, the consequences would be terrible. If my husband discovers our secret, he will never forgive me. And my daughter's life hardly be safe. Will you, like the chivalrous gentleman and soldier you are, leave at once before he finds you? At once, gracious lady. I only came to thank you and return the coat you lent me. If you will allow me to take it out of my bag and leave it with your servant as I pass out, I need detain you no further. Oh, you must not think of going back out that way. The shortest distance is that way out. And many thanks. So glad to have been of service to you. Uh, goodbye. But my bag. Shall be sent on. You will leave your address. True. Allow me. Ah, um, my dear Captain Bletchley. Oh, heavens. <laughs> Those stupid people of mine thought I was out here instead of in the hall, uh, library. <laughs> um, I saw you through the window. I was wondering why you didn't come in. Uh, Saranoff is with me. Uh, you remember him, don't you? Oh, come, our friend the enemy. Uh, no longer the enemy, happily. Uh, I hope you've called as a friend and uh, not about horses or prisoners, eh? Oh, quite a friend, Paul. I was just asking Captain Blunchley to stay to lunch. Oh, but he declares he must go at once. Oh, impossible, Blunchley. What we will you hear badly? We have sent on three cavalry regiments to Philippopolis, and we don't in the least know how to do it. Philippopolis? The forage is the trouble, I suppose. Uh, yes, uh, that's it. Uh, he sees the whole thing at once. I think I can show you how to manage that. Valuable man. Come along. Oh, the chocolate cream soldier. My dear Raina, don't you see that we have a guest here? A Captain Blanchley, one of our new Servian friends. How silly of me. I made a beautiful ornament this morning for the ice pudding and that stupid Nicola has just put down a pile of plates and spoiled it. I hope you didn't think that I that, that you were the so chocolate cream soldier, Captain Blunchley. <laughs> I, I assure you I did. Uh, Your explanation was a relief. And since when, pray, have you taken to cooking? Oh, whilst you were away, yeah. it is her latest fancy. And has Nicola taken to drinking? He used to be careful enough. First he shows Captain Blunchley out here when he knew quite well I was in the uh, library. And then he goes downstairs and breaks Raina's chocolate soldier. He must. Are you mad, Nicola? Sir. What have you brought that back for? My lady's orders, Major. Luca told me that. My orders? Why should I order you to bring Captain Blunchley's luggage out here? What are you thinking of, Nicola? I beg your pardon, sir, I'm sure. 
My fault, madam. I hope you'll overlook it. You'd better go and slam that bag, too, down on Miss Ryena's rice pudding. Be gone, you butterfingered donkey. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Never mind, Paul. Don't be angry. Scoundrel. He's got out of hand while I was away. I'll teach him. Uh, oh, well, never mind. Come, Blunchley, uh, let's have some, no more nonsense about having to go away. You know very well you're not going back to Switzerland yet, until you, and until you do go back, you'll stay with us. <laughs> oh, do, Captain Blunchley. Now, Catherine, it's of you he's afraid. Press him, and he'll stay. Of course, I shall be only too delighted. <laughs> if Captain Blunchley really wishes to stay, he knows my wishes. I am at Madam's orders. <laughs> oh, I it. Oh, of course. <laughs> you must stay. Well, if I must, I must. Stage manager, you're muted. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm talking to myself. Uh, so that concludes act two, and we will now begin act three of our performance. We're in the library after lunch. It is not much of a library. Its literary, literary equipment consists of a single fixed shelf stocked with old paper covered novels, broken backed, coffee stained, torn and thumbed, and a couple little hanging shelves with a few gift books on them the rest of the wall space being occupied by trophies of war and, and the chase. But it is a most comfortable sitting room. A row of three large windows shows a mountain panorama and now just now seen in one of the, its friendliest aspects in the mellowing afternoon light. In the corner next to the right-hand window, a square earthenware stove, a perfect tower of colored pottery, rises nearly to the ceiling and guarantees plenty of warmth. The ottoman in the middle of the ottoman in the middle is a circular bank of decorated cushions, and the window seats are well-upholstered divans. Little Turkish tables, one of them with an elaborate hookah on it, and a screen to match them, complete with the handsome effect of, complete the, handsome effect of the furnishing. There is one object, however, hopelessly out of keeping with its surroundings. It is a small kitchen table, much the worse for wear, fitted as a writing table with an old canister full of pens, an egg cup filled with ink, and a deplorable scrap of heavy-used ink, ink blotting paper. At the side of this table, which stands opposite the left-hand window, Blunchley is hard at work with a couple of maps before him, writing orders. At the head of it sits Sergius, who is supposed to be also at work, but is actually gnawing the feather of a pen. The major is comfortably established in the ottoman, with a newspaper in his hand and a tube of his hookah within reach. Catherine sits at the stove with her back to them, embroidering, and Raina, reclining on the divan under the right-hand window, is gazing in a daydream out at the Balkan landscape with a neglected novel in her lap. The door is on the same side as the stove, farther away from the window. The button of the electric bell is between the door and the stove. Are you sure I can't help you in any way, Blunchley? Quite sure, thank you. Uh, Saranoff and I will manage it. Yes, yes, we'll manage it. He finds all what to do, draw up the orders, and I sign them. Division of labor. Oh, another one. Thank you. Well, this hand is... Mm, more accustomed to the sword than to the pen. Oh, it's very good of you, Blunchley. It is indeed to let yourself be put up upon this way. You are quite sure I can do nothing? You can stop interrupting. Hey, uh, oh, quite right, my love, quite right. Uh, you, you haven't been campaigning, Catherine. You don't know how pleasant it is for us to sit here after a, a good lunch with nothing to do but enjoy ourselves. There's only one thing I want to make me thoroughly comfortable. What is that? <sighs> My old coat. I am not at home in this one. I feel as if I were on parade. My dear Paul, how absurd you are about that old coat. Well, it must be hanging in the blue closet where you left it. <sighs> My dear Catherine, I tell you I've looked there. Am I to believe my own eyes or not? My dear... If you think the obstinacy of your sex could make a coat out of two old dressing gowns of Raina's, your waterproof and my Macintosh were mistaken. That's exactly what the blue closet contains at present. Nicola! 
Go to the blue closet and bring your master's old coat here. The one he usually wears in the house. Yes, madame. Catherine? Yes, Paul? I bet you any piece of jewelry you like to order from Sophia against a week's housekeeping money that the coat isn't there. Done, Paul. <laughs> Come, here's an opportunity for some sport. Who'll bet on it, Blunchley? I'll, uh, I'll give you six to one. Uh, I, it would be robbing you, Major. Oh. And I'm sure to be right. <laughs> Bravo, Switzerland. Major, I'll bet my best charger against an Arab mare for Raina that Nicola finds the coat in the blue closet. Your best charger? Uh, don't be foolish, Paul. An Arabian mare will cost you 50,000 levers. Really, Mother, if you're going to take the jewelry, I don't see why you should grudge me my Arab. Huh. Where was it, Nicola? Hanging in the blue closet. Well, I am down. Oh. Uh, oh, I could have sworn it wasn't there. Well, you're just beginning to tell on me. I'm getting hallucinations. Uh, here. Help me to exchange. Excuse me, Blunchley. Uh, remember, I didn't take that bet of yours, Sergius. You'd better give Raina that Arab steed yourself, since you've roused her ex expectations, eh, Raina? <laughs> She's dreaming, as usual. But surely she shall not be the loser. Ah, so much the better for her. I shan't come off so cheap, I expect. Ah, now. Yes. I feel at home at last. That's the last order. What? Finished? Finished. Oh, hmm. uh, having you anything for me to sign? Not necessary. His signature will do. Ah, well, I think we've done a thundering good day's work. <laughs> uh, can I do anything more? You had better both see the fellows that are to take these. Uh, pack them off at once and show them that I've marked on the orders the time that they should hand them in by. Tell them that if they stop to drink or tell stories, if they're five minutes late, they'll have the skin taken off their backs. Yeah, I would say so. If one of them is man enough to spit in my face for insulting him, I'll buy his discharge and give him a pinch. Just see that he talks to them properly, Major, will you? Uh, quite right, Blunchley. Uh, quite right. I I'll see to it, yeah. By the by, Catherine, you may as well come, too. They'll be far more frightened of you than me. Or say I had better. You'd only sputter at them. What a country. They make cannons out of cherry trees. And the officers send for their wives to keep the discipline. <laughs> you look ever so much nicer than when we last met. What have you done to yourself? Washed. Brushed. Good night's sleep and breakfast, that's all. Did you get back safely that morning? Quite, thanks. Were they angry with you for running away from Sergius' charge? No, they were glad, because they'd all just run away themselves. It must have made a lovely story for them, all about me and my room. Oh, capital story. But I only told it to one of them, a particular friend. On whose discretion you could absolutely rely? Absolutely. He told it to my father and Sergius the day you exchanged prisoners. No. You don't mean that, do you? I do indeed. But they don't know it was in this house you took refuge. If Sergius knew, he would challenge you and kill you in a duel. Bless me. Well, don't tell them. Can you not realize what it is to me to deceive him? I want to be quite perfect with Sergius. No meanness, no smallness, no deceit. My relation to him is the one really beautiful and noble part of my life. I hope you can understand that. You mean that you wouldn't like him to find out that the story about the ice pudding was, uh, uh you know. I don't talk of it in that flippant way. I lied, I know it. But I did it to save your life. He would have killed you. That it was the second time I ever uttered a falsehood. Do you remember the first time? No. Was I present? Yes, and I told the officer who was searching for you that you were not present. True. I should have remembered it. It is natural that you should forget it first. 
cost you nothing. It cost me a lie. A lie! My dear young lady, don't let this worry you. Remember, I'm a soldier. Now, what are the two things that happen to a soldier so often that he comes to think nothing of them? One is hearing people tell lies. The other is getting his life saved in all sorts of ways by all sorts of people. And so he becomes a creature incapable of faith and gratitude. Do you like gratitude? I don't. If pity is akin to love, gratitude is akin to the other thing. Gratitude. If you're incapable of gratitude, you are incapable of any noble sentiment. Even animals are grateful. Oh, I see now exactly what you think of me. You're not surprised to hear me lie to you. It was something I probably did every day, every hour. That is how men think of women. There's reason in everything. You said you told only two lies in your whole life. Dear young lady, isn't that rather a short allowance? I'm quite a straightforward man myself, but it wouldn't last me a whole morning. Do you know, sir, that you are insulting me? I can't help it. When you strike that noble attitude and speak in that thrilling voice, I admire you. But I find it impossible to believe a single word you say. Captain Bluntschley? Yes. Do you mean what you said just now? Do you know what you said just now? I do. I, 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 Raina Petkov, tell lies. How did you find me out? Instinct, dear young lady. Instinct and experience of the world. You know, you are the first man I ever met who did not take me seriously. You mean, don't you, that I am the first man that has ever taken you quite seriously? Yes, I suppose I do mean that. How strange it is to be talked to in such a way. You know, I've always gone on like that. I mean, the noble attitude and the thrilling voice. I did it when I was a tiny child to my nurse. She believed in it. I do it before my parents. They believe in it. I do it before Sergius. He believes in it. Yes, he's a little in that line himself, isn't he? Oh, do you think so? Well, you know him better than I do. I wonder. I wonder, is he? If I thought that... Well, what does it matter? I suppose now you've found me out, you despise me. No, my dear young lady, no, 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 a thousand times. It's part of your youth. It's part of your charm. I'm like all the rest of them, the nurse, your parents, Sergius. I'm your infatuated admirer. Really? <laughs> Hands off out, really and truly. <laughs> but what did you think of me for giving you my portrait? Your portrait? You you never gave me your portrait. Do you mean to say you never got it? No. When did you send it to me? I did not send it to you. It was in the pocket of that coat. Oh, uh, I never found it. It must be there still. There still? For my father to find the first time he puts his hand in the pocket? How could you be so stupid? It doesn't matter. It's only a photograph. How could he tell who it was intended for? Tell him he put it there himself. Yes, that is so clever, so clever. What shall I do? Oh, uh, I see. You wrote something on it. That was rash. <laughs> to have done such a thing for you who care no more except to laugh at me. Oh. Are you sure nobody has touched it? Well, I can't be quite sure. You see, I couldn't carry it about with me all the time. One can't take much luggage on active service. What did you do with it? Well, when I got through to Pirat, I had to put it in safekeeping somehow, so I pawned it. Pawned it? I know it doesn't sound nice, but it was much the safest plan. I redeemed it in the day before yesterday. Heaven only knows whether the pawnbroker cleared out the pockets or not. You have a low shopkeeping mind. You think of things that would never come into a gentleman's head. That's the Swiss national character, dear lady. Oh, I wish I had never met you. Luca comes in with a heap of letters and telegrams on her salver and crosses with her bold free gait to the table. Her left sleeve is looped up to the shoulder with a brooch showing her naked arm with a, bro with a broad gilt bracelet covering her bruise. For you. The messenger is waiting. Will you excuse me? The last postal delivery that reached me was three weeks ago. These are the subsequent ac uh, accumulations. Four telegrams, a week old. Oh, bad news. 
bad news? My father is dead. How very sad. Yes. I shall have to start for home in an hour. He's left a lot of big hotels behind him to be looked after. Uh, here's a whacking letter from the family solicitor. Great heavens. 7,200. 400, 4,000. 9,600. What on earth am I to do with them all? 9,000 hotels? Hotels. Nonsense. He only knew. Oh, it's too ridiculous. Excuse me, I must give my fellow orders about starting. He has not much heart, that Swiss, though he is so fond of the Servians. He has not a word of grief for his poor father. Grief? A man who's been doing nothing but killing people for years. What does he care? What does any soldier care? Major Saranov has been fighting too, and he has plenty of heart left. Aha! I thought you wouldn't get much feeling out of your soldier. I've been trying all afternoon to get a minute alone with you, my girl. Why, what fashion is that of wearing your sleeve, child? My own fashion. Indeed. Hmm. If the mis mistress catches you, she'll talk to you. Is there is that any reason why you should take it on yourself to talk to me? Um, don't be so contrary with me. I've got some good news for you. See? A 20 leaver bill. Sergius gave me that after, out of pure swagger. A fool and his money are soon parted. Then there's 10 levers more. The Swiss gave me that for backing up the mistresses and Raina's lies about him. He's no fool, he isn't. You should have heard old Catherine downstairs as polite as you please to me, telling me not to mind the major being a little impatient for they knew what a good servant I was after making a fool and a liar of me before all. The 20 will go to our savings and you shall have 10 to spend if you only talk to me so as to remind me I'm a human being. I get tired of being a servant occasionally. Yes, sell your manhood for 30 levers and buy me for 10. Keep your money. You were born to be a servant, I was not. When you set up your shop, you will only be everybody's servant instead of somebody's servant. I'll wait till you see. We shall have our evenings to ourselves and I shall be master in my own house. I promise you. Well, you shall never be the master in mine. You have great ambition in you, Luca. Remember, if any luck comes to you, it was I that made a woman of you. You? Yes, me. Who was it made you give up wearing a couple of pounds of black false hair on your head and reddening your lips and cheeks like any other Bulgarian girl? I did. Who taught you to trim your nails and keep your hands clean and be dainty about yourself like a fine Russian lady? Me. Do you hear that? Me. I've often thought that if Raina were out of the way, and you just a little less of a fool, and Sergius just a little more of one, you might come to be one of my grandest customers, instead of only being my wife and costing me money. I believe you would rather be my servant than my husband. You would make more out of me. Oh, I knew, I know that soul of yours. Never you mind about my soul, but just listen to my advice. If you want to be a lady, your present behavior to me won't do at all, unless when you are alone. It's too sharp and impudent, and impudence is a sort of familiarity. It shows affection for me. And don't you try being high and mighty with me either. You're like all country girls. You think it's genteel to treat a servant the way I treat a sable boy. That's only your ignorance, and don't you forget it. And don't be so ready to defy everybody. Act as if you expected to have your own way, not as if you expected to be ordered about. The way to get on as a lady is the same as a way to get on as a servant. You've got to know your place. That's the secret of it. And you may depend on me to know my place if you get promoted. Think over it, my girl. I'll stand by you. One servant should always stand by another. 
I must behave in my own way. You take all the courage out of me with your cold-blooded wisdom. Go and put logs on the fire. That's the sort of thing you understand. Am I in the way of your work, I hope? Oh, no, sir. Thank you kindly. I was only speaking to this foolish girl about her habit of running up here to the library whenever she gets a chance. Look at the books. That's the worst of her education, sir. It gives her habits above her station. Make that ti table tidy, Luca, for the major. Let's see. Is there a mark there? Does it hurt? Yes. Shall I cure it? No. You cannot cure it now. Quite sure? Don't trifle with me, please. An officer should not trifle with a servant. That was no trifle, Luca. Are you sorry? I'm never sorry. I wish I could believe a man could be as unlike a woman as that. I wonder, are you really a brave man? Yes, I'm a brave man. My heart jumped like a woman's at the first shot. But in the charge, I found that I was brave. Yes, that would at least is real about me. Did you find that in the charge that the men whose fathers are poor like mine were any less brave than the men who are rich like you? Not a bit. They all slashed and cursed and yelled like heroes. <laughs> The courage to rage and kill is cheap. I have an English bull terrier who has as much of that sort of courage as the whole Bulgarian nation. And the whole Rush and the whole Russian nation at its back. He likes my groom thrasher. All the same. That's a soldier all over. No, Luca. The poor men can cut throats, but they're afraid of the officers. They put up with insults and blows. They stand by and see one another punished like children. I am helped to do it when they're ordered. And the officers, well, well, I'm an officer. Well, give me the man who will defy to death any power on earth or in heaven that sets itself up against his own will and conscience. He alone is a brave man. How easy it is to talk. Men never seem to me to grow up. They all have schoolboys' ideas. You don't know what true courage is. Oh, indeed. I'm willing to be instructed. Look at me. How much am I allowed to have my own will? I have to get your room ready for you. To sweep and dust, to fetch and carry. How could that degrade me if it did not degrade you to have it done for you? But if I were Empress of Russia above everyone in the world, then, uh, then, though according to you, I should show no courage at all, you should see. You should see. Oh, yes, and what would you do, my most noble Empress? I would marry the man I loved, which no other queen in Europe has the courage to do. If I loved you, though you would be as far beneath me as I am beneath you, I would dare to be the equal to my inferior. Would you dare as much if you loved me? No. If you felt the beginnings of love for me, you would not let it grow. You dare not. You would marry a rich man's daughter because you wouldn't be afraid of what other people would say to you. Oh, you lie. It is not so by all the stories. If I loved you, and I were the czar himself, I would set you on the throne by myself. You know that I love another woman, a woman as high above you as heaven is above earth. And you are jealous of her. I have no reason to be. She will never marry you now. The man I told you has come back. She will marry the Swiss. The Swiss? A man worth 10 of you. 
then you can come to me and I will refuse you. You are not good enough for me. Oh, kill the Swiss. And afterwards I will do whatever I please with you. The Swiss will kill you, perhaps. He's beaten you in love, he may beat you in war. Do you think I believe that she, she, whose worst thoughts are higher than your best ones, is capable of trifling with another man behind my back? Do you think that she would believe the Swiss if he told her now what, that I am in your arms? Oh, damnation. Oh, damnation. Mockery. Mockery everywhere. Everything I think is mocked by everything I do. Coward. Liar. Fool. Shall I kill myself like a man, or live and pretend to laugh at myself? Luca, remember, you belong to me. What does that mean? An insult? It means that you love me, and I, and I have had you here in my arms, and will perhaps have you there again. Whether that's an insult, I neither know or care, take as you please, but I will not. Be a coward and a trifler. If I choose to love you, I dare marry you in spite of all Bulgaria. If these hands ever touch you again, they shall touch you by a fianced bride. We shall see whether you keep your word. And take care, I will not wait long. Yes, we shall see. And we shall wait my pleasure. That's a remarkable looking young woman. Captain Florence. Hey. You have deceived me. You are my rival. I brook no rivals. I Cisco her. I shall be in the drilling ground in the Colossova Road alone on horseback with my saber. Do you understand? Oh, thank you. That's a cavalryman's proposal. I'm in the artillery, and I, I have the choice of weapons. If I go, I shall take a machine gun. And there shall be no mistake about the cartridges this time. Take care, sir. It is not our custom in Bulgaria to allow invitations of that kind to be trifled with. Oh, don't talk to me about Bulgaria. You don't know what fighting is. But have it your own way. Bring your saber along. I'll meet you. Well said. Switch. Shall I lend you my best horse? Oh, damn your horse. Thank you all the same, my dear fellow. I shall fight you on foot. Horseback's too dangerous. I don't want to kill you if I can help it. We've heard what Clapton Blunchy said, Sergius. You're going to fight, why? What, what about? I, I don't know, he hasn't told me. Uh, better not in interfere, dear young lady. No harm will be done. I've often acted as sword instructor. He won't be able to touch me, and I'll not hurt him. It will save explanations. In the morning, I shall be off home, and you'll never see me or hear of me again. You and he will then make it up and live happily ever after. I said I never wanted to see you again. Huh, that's a confession. What do you mean? You love that man. Sergius. You allow him to make love to you behind my back? just as you treat me as your affianced husband behind his. Blanche, you know our relations, and you deceive me. It is for that I call you to account, not for having received favors I never enjoyed. Stuff, rubbish. I have received no favors. Why, well, the young lady doesn't even know whether I'm married or not. Oh, are you? Oh, oh you see the young lady's concern? Captain Blunchley, denial is useless. You have enjoyed the privilege of being received in her own room, late at night. Yes, you blockhead, she received me with a pistol at her head. Your cavalry were at my heels. I'd have blown out her brains if she uttered a cry. Blanche, Raina, is this true? Oh, how dare you, how dare you? Apologize, man, apologize. I never apologize. This is the doing of that friend of yours, Captain Blunchley. It's he who is spreading this horrible story about me. No. He's dead. Burnt alive. Burnt alive? Shot in the hip in a wood yard. 
couldn't drag himself out. Your fellow shells set the timber on fire and burnt him, with half a dozen other poor devils in the same predicament. How horrible! More ridiculous. Oh, war. War. A dream of patriots and heroes. A fraud. Blanche. Oh, like love. Like, like love? You say that before me? Come, Saranov. That matter is explained. A hollow sham, I say. Would you have come back here if nothing had passed between you except at the muzzle of your pistol? Raina is mistaken about your friend who was burned. He was not my informant. Who then? Ah, Luca, my maid, my servant. You were with her this morning, all that time, after, after. Oh, what sort of god is this I have been worshipping? Do you know that I looked out of the window as I went upstairs to have another sight of my hero? And I saw something I did not understand then. I know now that you were making love to her. <laughs> you saw that. Only too well. <sighs> Raina, our romance is shattered. Life is a farce. You see, he's found himself out now. Blanchely, I've allowed you to call me a blockhead. You may not call me a coward as well. I refuse to fight you. Do you know why? No, but it doesn't matter. I didn't ask the reason when you cried on, and I don't ask the reason now that you cry off. I'm a professional soldier. I fight when I have to, and I am very glad to get out of it when I haven't. You're only an amateur. You think fighting's an amusement. You should hear the reason all the same, my professional. The reason is that it takes two men, real men, men of heart, blood and honor to make a genuine combat. I could no more fight you than I could make love with an ugly woman. You have no magnetism. You are not a man. You are a machine. Quite true. Quite true. I always was that sort of chap. I'm very sorry. But now that you've found that life isn't a farce, but something quite sensible and serious, what further obstacle is there to your happiness? You are very solicitous about my happiness and his. Do you forget his new love, Luca? Is it not you that he must fight now, but his rival, Nicola? Rival? Don't you know that they're engaged? Nicola! A fresh abyss is coming. Nicola! A shocking sacrifice, isn't it? Such beauty, such intellect, such modesty, wasted on a middle-aged servant man. Really, Sergius, you cannot stand by and allow such a thing. It would be unworthy of your chivalry. Viper. Viper! Look here, Saranoff. You're getting the worst of this. Do you realize what he has done, Captain Bletchley? He has set this girl as a spy on us, and her reward is that he makes love to her. False! Monstrous! Monstrous! Do you deny that she told you about Captain Bluntschli being in my room? No, but... Do you deny that you were making love to her when she told you? No, but I tell you! It is unnecessary to tell us anything more. That is quite enough for us. I told you you were getting the worst of it, Saranoff. Tiger cat. You hear this man calling me names, Captain Bluntschli? What else can he do, dear lady? He must defend himself somehow. Come. Don't quarrel. What good does it do? <laughs> Engage to Nicola. Huh. Oh, well, Blanchley, you are right to make, to take this huge imposter of a world coolly. I dare say you think us a couple of grown-up babies, don't you? Oh, he does. He does. Swiss civilization nurse-tending Bulgarian barbarism, eh? Not at all, I assure you. I'm only very glad to get you two quieted. There, there. Now, let's be pleasant and talk it over in a friendly way. Now, where is this other young lady? Listening at the door, probably. I'll prove you that that, at least, is a colony. Aha. Uh -huh. Judge her, Longley. You, the cool, impartial man. Judge the eavesdropper. I mustn't judge her. I once listened myself outside a tent when there was a mutiny brewing. It's all a question of the degree of provocation. My life was at stake. My love was at stake. 
I am not ashamed. Your love, your curiosity, you mean. My love, stronger than anything you can feel, even for your chocolate cream soldier. What does that mean? It means. Oh, oh I remember the ice pudding. A poultry tongued girl. Uh, excuse my shirt sleeves, gentlemen. Uh, Raina, somebody has been wearing that coat of mine. I swear it. Somebody with bigger shoulders than mine. It's all burst open at the back. Your mother is mending it. I wish she'd make haste. I shall catch cold. Uh, is anything the matter? No. Oh, no. Nothing. Nothing. Well, that's all right. Anything the matter, Luca? No, sir. Oh, that's all right. <clears throat> Go and ask your mistress for my coat like a good girl, will you? She turns to obey, but Nicola enters just then with the coat and makes the pretense of having business in the room by taking a little table with the hookah away to the wall near the windows. Here it is, Papa. Give it to me, Nicola. Then do you put some more wood on the fire? Oh. Ah, ha. Going to be a very good to... Poor old Papa, just for one day after his return from the wars, eh? How can you say that to me, Father? Well, only a little joke, just a little. Come, give me a kiss. Now, uh, give me the coat. No, I'm going to put it on for you. Turn your back. <laughs> there, dear. Are you comfortable? Ah, yes. Quite little love, thanks. Oh, by the by, I've... I found something funny. What's the meaning of this? Eh? Hello? Ooh. Well, I could have sworn. Hmm, I wonder. Where can it? Your mother's taken it. Taken what? Your photograph with the inscription writing it to her chocolate cream soldier, a souvenir. Now, you know there's something more in this than meets the eye, and I am going to find out. Nicola? Uh, sir? Did you spoil any pastry of Miss Ryanis this morning? You heard Miss Ryanis say that I did, sir. I know that, you idiot. Was it true? I'm sure Miss Ryanis is incapable of saying anything that is not true, sir. Are you? Then I'm not. <sighs> Come, do you think I don't see it at all? Sergius, you're the chocolate cream soldier, aren't you? I, the chocolate cream soldier, certainly not. Not? Do, do you mean to tell me that Ryanus sends photographic souvenirs to other men? The world is not such an innocent place as we used to think, Peckoff. It's all right, Major. I'm the chocolate cream soldier. Gracious young lady saved my life by giving me chocolate creams when I was starving. Shall I ever forget their flavor? My late friend Stoltz told you the story of Perot. I was the fugitive. You! Sergius, do you remember how those two young women went on this morning when we mentioned it? You're a nice young woman, aren't you? Major Saranov has changed his mind. And when I wrote that on the photograph, I did not know that Captain Blinchley was married. I'm not married. You said you were. I did not. I positively did not. I never was married in my life. Raina, will you kindly inform me, if I'm not asking too much, which of these gentlemen you are engaged to? To neither of them. This young lady is the object of Major Serrano's affections at present. Luca, are you mad, Sergius? Why, this girl's engaged to Nicola. I beg your pardon, sir. There is a mistake. Luca is not engaged to me. Not engaged to you, you scoundrel. Why, you had 25 levers for me of the day of your betrothal, and she had that gilt bracelet from Miss Raina. We gave it out so, sir. But it was only to give Luca protection. She had a soul above her station, and I have been no more than her confidential servant. I intend, as you know, sir, to set up a shop later on in Sophia, 
and I look forward to her custom and recommendation should she marry into the nobility. Well, I am... T mm. This is either the finest heroism or the most crawling baseness. Which is it, Blanchley? Well, never mind whether it's heroism or baseness. Nicola is the ablest man I've met in Bulgaria. I'll make him manager of a hotel if he can speak French and German. I have been insulted by everyone here. You set the example. You owe me an apology. I, it's no use. He never apologizes. Not to you, his equal and his enemy. To me, his poor servant, he will not have refused to apologize. All right. Forgive me. I forgive you. That touch makes me your affianced wife. Huh. I forgot that. You can withdraw if you like. Withdraw? Never! You belonged. What does this mean? Well, uh, my dear, it appears that Sergius is going to marry Luca instead of Raina. Uh, don't blame me. I have nothing to do with it. Mary Luca? Sergius, you are bound by your word to us. Nothing binds me. Saranoff, your hand. My congratulations. These heroics of yours have their practical side after all. A gracious young lady, the best wishes. Luca. You have been telling stories. I have done Raina no harm. Raina? I have a right to call her Raina. She calls me Luca. I told Major Saranoff that she would never marry him if the Swiss, Swiss gentleman came back. Hello. I thought you were fonder of him than of Sergius. You know best whether I was right. <laughs> what nonsense. I assure you, my dear Major, my dear Madame, the gracious young lady simply saved my life, nothing else. She never cared two straws for me. I bless my heart and soul. Look at the young lady and look at me. She's rich, young, beautiful, with her imagination full of fairy princes and noble natures and cavalry charges and goodness knows what. And I, a commonplace Swiss soldier who hardly knows what a decent life is after 15 years of barracks and battles. A vagabond. A man who has spoiled all his chances in life through an incurably romantic disposition. A man who... I, uh, excuse me, Blanchley. What did you say? Has spoiled your chances in life? An incurably romantic disposition. I ran away from home twice when I was a boy. I went into the army instead of into my father's business. I climbed the balcony of this house when a man of sense would have dived into the nearest cellar. I came sneaking back here to have another look at the young lady when any other man of my age would have just sent the coat back and- My coat? Yes, that's the coat, I mean. They would have sent it back and gone quietly home. You suppose I'm the sort of fellow a young girl falls in love with? Well, look at her ages. I'm 34. I don't suppose the young lady is much over 17? All that adventure, which was life or death to me, was only a schoolgirl's game to her. Chocolate creams and hide and seek. Uh, here's the proof. Now I ask you, would a woman who took the affair seriously have sent me this and written on it, Raina, to her chocolate cream soldier, a souvenir? That was what I was looking for. How the deuce did it get there? I've put everything right. I hope, gracious young lady. I quite agree with your account of yourself. You are a romantic idiot. Next time, I hope you will know the difference between a schoolgirl of 17 and a woman of 23. 23? 23. Uh, My one last belief is gone. Your sagacity is a fraud. Like all the other things, you have less sense than even I have. Twenty-three? Twenty-three! Huh. In that case, Major Petkoff, I beg to propose formally to become a suitor for your daughter's hand in place of Major Saranov, retired. You dare? 
if you were 23 when you said those things to me this afternoon, I shall take them seriously. I doubt, sir, whether you quite realize either my daughter's position or that Major Sergius Saranov, whose place you propose to take. The Petkovs and the Saranovs are known as the richest and most important families in the country. Our position is almost historic. We can go back. For 20 years. Oh, never mind that, Catherine. We should be most happy, Blunchley, if it were only a question of your position, but uh, hang it, you know, Ryan is accustomed to a very comfortable establishment. Sergius keeps 20 horses. What on earth is the use of 20 horses? It, it, it's a circus. My daughter, sir, is accustomed to a first rate stable. Hush, mother, you're making me ridiculous. Oh, well, if it comes to a question of an establishment, here goes. Uh, how many horses did you say? Plenty, noble sweet sir. Hmm. I have 200 horses. Uh, how many carriages? Three. I have 70. Uh, 24 of them will hold 12 inside, besides two on the box, without counting the driver and conductor. Uh, how many tablecloths do you have? Well, how the deuce would I know? Have you 4,000? No. I have. I have 9,600 pairs of sheets and blankets with 2,400 eider-down quilts. I have 10,000 knives and forks and the same quantity of dessert spoons. Uh, I have 300 servants. I have six palatial establishments besides two livery stables, a tea garden, and a private house. I have um, four medals for distinguished services. I have the rank of an officer and the standing of a gentleman. And I have three native languages. Show me any man in Bulgaria that can offer you that much. Are you emperor of Switzerland? My rank is the highest known in Switzerland. I'm a free man. Then, Captain Blunchley, since you are my daughter's choice, I shall not stand in the way of your happiness. Uh, uh, that is Major Petkoff's feeling also. Yeah, I, I shall only be too glad. 200 horses, whew. What says the lady? The lady says that he can keep his tablecloths and his omnibuses. I'm not here to be sold to the highest bidder. I won't take that answer. I appeal to you as a fugitive, a beggar, and a starving man. You accepted me. You gave me your hand to kiss, your bed to sleep in, and your roof to shelter me. I did not give them to the Emperor of Switzerland. That's just what I say. Now tell us who you did give them to to my chocolate cream soldier. That'll do. Thank you. Well, time's up, Major. You've managed those regiments so well that you're sure to be asked to get rid of some of the infantry of the Timok Division. Send them home by way of Lampalanka. Uh, Saranov, don't get married until I come back. I shall be here punctually at five in the evening on Tuesday fortnight. Gracious ladies, good evening. What a man. What a man. Thank you all. What a wonderful show tonight. Uh, so now that uh, we are done with the show, we are just going to take a moment to uh, discuss one more time, the fact that the Center for Performing Arts is considered a home to many of our actors in better times and even now, I know my son is starting camp there on Monday, so they are, they are managing to hold some events, uh, but they are also currently looking to reach a matching grant. So if you can donate tonight, you donate twice. When they hit $25,000, they're going to see a matching grant for $25,000, and we're hoping for that for them right now. Um, tonight's performance with Living Room Shakespeare, we had uh, our performers tonight in the role of the officer, briefly near the beginning there, we had Carl. Oh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> in the role of Nicola, we had Chris. Hi, thanks very much. 
in the role in the role of Luca, we had Julia. Hi. <laughs> in the role of Catherine, we had Kelly. Hey, everybody! Thank you. Donate if you can. In the role of uh, Major Paul, we had Roger. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for watching, and please give if you can to the center. Thank you. In the role of Sergius, we had Steve. Thank you all very much. In the role of Blunchley, we had Joe. Thanks, everyone. Please donate if you can. And in the role of Raina, we had Vera. Thank you. Please donate. Tonight's cast was small but mighty, and I thank them so much for coming together to work with us tonight. Good night once again from Living Room Shakespeare. Good night. <laughs>